Hello, my name is Bernd Müller and I'm a psychotherapist in private practice. Welcome to today's session. Share my screen with you. And moving on from here, psychotherapy in dangerous times, the role of psychosocial treatment in tackling the overdose crisis. So I'm reaching you from the unceded territories of the Squamish nation here in Squamish. And my pronouns are he, him, and his. So moving towards an integrative response to the overdose crisis and the contribution of psychotherapy. So we are observing an increase in self-referrals to private practice, to psychotherapy. At the same time, we do not see that um, psychotherapy is moving more into the limelight when it comes to the public response to the overdose crisis. So this is maybe a conversation that is worth having to see like if there is a contribution that's worth exploring in regards to psychotherapy and how to bring this to the population we are working with. So what we notice is that trauma, pain and substance use the majority of times go hand in hand. So there's a strong relationship between adverse childhood events, the ACEs, and three landmarks of opioid use, for example, the age of opioid initi initiation, injection drug use, and lifetime overdose. And the idea is the association between prescribed opioid dosage for chronic pain and risk of unintentional opioid overdoses also has been observed. So we have a clear understanding of how trauma and pain, chronic physical pain, contributes to substance use. Here's another chart, trauma and substance use. Early trauma has been strongly linked to later in life substance use. And we notice here the physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional neglect, and physical neglect are very strong indicators of an increase in substance use in comparison to the general population. And we find a uh, really a bunch of evidence from research seeing these associations between trauma and substance use and chronic pain and substance use. So ACEs, uh, adverse childhood events, we usually talk about 10 categories here, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, and so forth. Just for your information, all these slides will be made available to you later on. So this is also for your information and overview when it comes to exploring certain therapies. So the idea here of psychotherapy is available for pain and for chronic pain, substance use and trauma. So psychotherapy has been effectively reduced chronic pain symptoms. And the approaches are here, mindfulness-based therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy. And both of those therapies we will look into a little bit later and integrative approaches have been effectively re reduced trauma symptoms and substance use and we are talking EMDR, acceptance and commitment therapy and seeking safety as approaches that are both targeting substance use and co-occurring mental health problems. These three approaches we also will give a closer look somewhere down this presentation. So four approaches I like to give a closer look here is ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy, and then seeking safety just snuck in there, so ignore that please, mindfulness-based stress reduction, MBSR, eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing, EMDR and seeking safety. Starting with acceptance and commitment therapy, getting unstuck. So developed by Stephen C. Hayes, in 1982, objective is not eliminating of difficult feelings, but bringing present with being present and learning to stay with sensations, noticing what's happening and moving towards valuing behavior, value behavior, identifying values and what gets us going in the first place, identifying motivations and a deeper understanding of what is the value behind our actions integrates scientific knowledge about contingency shaped behavior and verbal relations. So ACT is broken down in six principles and 
cognitive diffusion, expansion and acceptance, contact and connection with the present moment. That is the whole mindfulness realm. We are also finding in MBSR. So this is a first indicator in how all these approaches densely, nicely with each other. The observing self values clarification as already mentioned and committed action. And this can be nicely translated into the hexaflex um, diagram here. And this is a document that I'm using. And I took a picture of that because, so to just give an idea of like, what that might look like in session, so well used, well worn as we see here. So the hexaflex is nothing else than six principles we need to attend to in order to get unstuck or stay psychologically flexible. And the idea is here, if we dense all six principles of the hexaflex, we get unstuck. So if one falls apart, everything else deteriorates. Good news is that if we re-erect one element again and pay special attention to it, all other five also fall usually in place and follow suit. And the shadow side of the flexibility piece is psychological inflexibility. And here are the opposites of it's the experience of unhelpful behavior that gets us stuck. And if we like just step into values here, for example, on the hexaflex, we can break that down into another chart and notice things. So let's say we get out of bed and the idea is here, and this is a work with a client here at this poor moment. So just exploring what Gets us, gets us out of bed. What is a driver of all things? And now this trying to distinguish between goals and values. The values are the non-negotiables in our lives. And we have a few of those, but not too many. And they're usually staying the same over long periods of time, while sub goals and goals leading up to values are the negotiables in our lives. And coming to an understanding of, if we are, have a clear view to our values, we are having a good day while we're experiencing an interruption or an obstacle on our way to values, we are experiencing negative feelings, frustration or depression. So the idea is to get to an understanding of uncomfortable feelings, of depressive feelings, of the feeling stuck notion, the, feeling, the, the reaction of the mind of feeling stuck and identifying that the crisis, a goal crisis. And the idea here is if we cannot accomplish a sub goal or a goal, there's a way to either navigate, do we, can we find ways to circumnavigate that sub goal or replace that goal or sub goal since it's negotiable in order to go back on track to meet our values. And possible values here are social connection, acceptance, self acceptance, adventure, fairness, honesty, and so forth. So the idea is to explore a little bit what kept, gets us going here, as I already mentioned. and yeah, this is um, something that has been shown in my private practice, especially valuable with folks who are experiencing issues around substance use. And yeah, it was quite insightful for a lot of folks. So again, the research here, so it, it is a effectively reutilized to treat both chronic pain and substance use. And the pilot studies that are implemented here that we are observing right now is like noticing that how comorbid chronic pain and opioid addictions both are addressed and especially the role of shame is something that especially here in this research study with Kohlenberg and colleagues um, has been explored and quite interesting results here because shame is something that is often at the center of the experience when we are yeah, working with the population that's mostly impacted with the substance use. So just as a little um, remark here on that notion. Again, here's some research results here. So again, the idea here is noticing how act densely very nicely with other approaches. So that might be like, like the combination of 12 step facilitation or other approaches like MBSR or EMDR. And these are all very promising results. How ACT acceptance commitment therapy has been found quite helpful according to the research we can find. So moving forward, MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction. Framing this 
with one quote here that's um, part of the framework, you are not your pain and meaning addressing the relationship we have with chronic pain and emotional suffering. And finding that that often results in an experience of decreased pain experience. And let's give this a closer look. Well, the MBSR is broken down in an eight-week program, usually facilitated as an eight-week program, it's evidence-based secular, and developed by Jean Kabat-Zinn in the 1970s, combining meditation, mindful movement, yoga, the exploration of patterns of thinking, feeling, and behavior, and addressing physical and emotional pain, suffering. MBSR is based on rigorous and systematic training in mindfulness, a form of meditation originally developed in the Buddhist traditions of Asia. Simply put, mindfulness is moment to moment, non judgmental awareness. It is cultivated by purposefully paying attention to things we ordinarily never give a moment thought to. It is a systematic approach to developing new kinds of agency, control, and wisdom in our lives based on our inner capacity for paying attention and on the awareness, insight, and compassion that naturally arise from paying attention in specific ways. That's John kabat We facilitate MBSR is an AV program and the eight topics we are covering are introduction to mindfulness meditation. And we are then moving into Perception knowing are different. There's pleasure and power in being present. Stress reactivity. Stress, mindful awareness and responding. Stressful communications. How do I best take care of myself? And endings are beginnings. And one element here is also the silent retreat one day within the course. And throughout the course, we are providing opportunities for mindful movement and guiding those movement and mindfulness meditation. And the relaxation exercises and the yoga can provide physical relief by releasing tension and improving circulation. And this has been shown in several studies. However, the main benefit comes through changing the way you perceive and react to your pain. And this is a perspective of changing your relationship to pain. So many times our thoughts about our pain, physical pain and emotional pain triggered by fear are very negative. Thoughts like, this is killing me, I can't stand it. How long will this go on? Cause us to feel worse. Through meditation, we are able to separate our thoughts from the physical sensations and also from the emotional experience. Experiencing here a dramatic, dramatically change in experiencing suffering in a, to a, in a in a decreased level of intensity. So just taking one example out of the eight week program here, this would be week five. And this session is about exploring an understanding of our automatic reactions to stressors. And so there's a formal meditation practice here. There's a, an element of self-compassion Again, the idea of shame that we mentioned early on also has a part here, the guilt and shame feelings often surrounding our experience of mental health, mental well-being and substance use, and the awareness of our own limits and boundaries and letting go of judgmental thoughts. And to just give this a closer look, here's one element how we can actually look at our stress experience. So the idea of being an automatic pilot, this stress triangle introduces stress as a trigger here that activates our nervous system to the left side here and moves right to reactivity. So the idea here is we have a stressor and we go right to action. And the idea is that we are in doing mode and that's the that's the topic here. We move to doing mode. And doing mode is helpful because it gets us out of a burning building. It gets us out of a stressful, threatening situation where the real threat is imminent. 
And we can also translate that into the language of fight flight response. So we are now running away. We are not thinking blood is leaving our frontal lobe, moving into the amygdala, and we are in stress. We are in fight flight mode and engage in our sympathetic nervous system and do and do and do in order to get out of the dangerous situation, either finding it or running away from it or getting into a free state where we hope that um, the wind blows over and we survive the situation. It's still a highly charged state where we bolt the moment the threat is over. So this is helpful again when the house is burning or there's a real threat. If there is only a trigger and no real threat, it is unhelpful. It can be considered unhelpful behavior and it leads to chronic stress and the whole, the whole chronic stress experience where we continuously in reactivity mode is, yeah, we, we experience that as quite unhelpful for many reasons. And so the idea here moving to a mindfulness approach, so mindful approach, plucking in mindfulness here, noticing the stressor, and again, not pushing it away, not moving it under the, not pushing it under the carpet, having an awareness of activation here to the left and paying intentional attention to it and moving to response. So we are moving from doing more to being with more. The idea of being able to distinguish between a threat and a trigger. So if it's a threat, I need to act on it. If everything is secured, if there's no threat in the room, if we are safe, it's a trigger. And a trigger means we have time. We don't have to act right away. So the idea here is, so can I be with the sensation a little bit longer? Do I have to act on it or can I be with it? So now we are moving to an extra choice point. We move from one choice point to, from like, I have to act on it to a second choice point. I can act on it or I can stay with it for a moment. I can be with it. And so if you have two choice points, there's no space for the suicidal thoughts, for deep depression or aggressive behavior or anger, because now we can just take the other door as a second choice point. So this has been found quite helpful, including yeah, in my in BSR practice as like a foundational introduction to modifying our response to stressors. The MBSR here evidence-based increased in pain tolerance the outcomes here, that change in positive mood, improve stress, anxiety scores, and improvement in health-related quality of life in substance-dependent population, in addiction treatment. So MBSR, this is also for your information. We are just giving that a really brief look here. So the idea of what's working when we work, especially with folks who are experiencing substance use as an issue in their life. So mindfulness intervention here on the left, they're moving, like we do a technique like the body scan, for example, the biological mechanism, we can talk here like amplifying prefrontal activation, like going back online, they're having executive functioning and online here. So that's the next part, the behavioral mechanism, and boosting executive functioning and the outcome on the clinical side, decreased distress. And these are possible pathways that can be tracked by applying mindfulness, quite helpful when we work with our populations. Yeah. Body scan, again, is one example, is a key part of um, these, as this eight big program, the foundational part. This is nothing else than a um, mindful meditation or noticing different parts of your body. It's about 40 minutes long, and we ask participants to do that on a daily basis, possible, or at least every other day. And the results are that this is one of the main contributors to changing re the, our relationship to the experience of chronic pain. There's a little quote that is um, referring to the experience of mental health and mental well-being as being in a moment, like present moment awareness. And this is just one participant here in one of Kabat-Zinn's early groups. I've had my moments and if I had it, if I had to do it over again, I'd have more of them. In fact, I try to have nothing else, just moments, one after another, instead of living so many years ahead of each day. And this is maybe something we can pause on for a moment, even right now, and just going through our day. How have we spent our day? And are we 
spending time around present moment awareness or are we of in the next moment? And this is also the entry point of anxiety when it comes to the, if we always live in the present moment. And this is often, of course, the experience of our clients that if you're living in tomorrow and we start ruminating and noticing that rumination is the same cognitive signature like running away from a predator. So we are increasingly subject to increased arousal states by always being in the next moment eh? or the past moment, always in regret where the shame has its root, always in the past and not being able to, yeah, letting go. So here, an idea of inviting present moment awareness. MBSR, treating trauma induced stress. And this is here the, the bridge to the earlier um, mentioning of the ACE. So adverse childhood events lead to stress reaction in the body and MBSR reduces stress in the body. So we are working exactly where we need to work. MBSI is addressing adverse health effects of trauma. And there's another piece that is probably moving in more into the future of psychotherapy, even the work with the body, really understanding the body as the first line of experience and also as a big memory, yeah, memory file for uh, uh, this memory storage for adverse events and noticing when we change things in our body, with our body, we often also change a narrative about the event and the trauma experience. Therefore, our relationship to emotional suffering. So really having this bottom-up approach, yeah, working with the body when it comes to trauma. Yeah, and then there are charts in the research body of MBSR that um, yeah, prove some medical findings, that show some medical findings and yeah, underpin the the so, yeah, usefulness of MBSR, even on many ways. You know, this is Mary's sleep graph, you know, how sleep, how she um, got to better good night's sleep and from sleep disturbance to the restful sleep. Same with uh, the blood pressure went down and also the pain charts. And we have that in our own practice as well here when people sign up the pain charts, all the dark spots are the experience chronic pain. And after eight weeks, of um, treatment, we find very little of those now or, or different ones. And this this is very curious and interesting findings. Yeah. So I am just um, aware of our time here. And I just want to maybe just also briefly notice, uh, really refer here to eye movement desensitization and reprocessing EMDR as one way of um, addressing trauma, befriending and updating the younger self. And the idea here is, um, also first of all, of course, EMDR, 1989, Francine Shapiro um, established, uh, published the, uh, on this topic, integrated psychotherapeutic approach, and dances again very nicely with other, other approaches in psychotherapy, eight-phase protocol, and I have that all laid out here in the slides. We don't have to go, go over it in detail. You can um, review that later. Again, this will all be made accessible to you. Three prompt approach. We're touching. We, we are addressing the past, the present, and the future. EMDR is based on an adaptive information processing model. A theoretical framework here. The memory networks constitute the basis of our perceptions, attitudes, and behaviors, and these memories consist of stored information. And disturbing events, events such as ACEs, may cause disruption in our information processing system. As we look at memories like stored, like books on a bookshelf, the traumatic experience would be the Jan book. So the information that is not accessible for us to learn from. And in this model, it would be the maladaptively stored information, dysfunctionally stored. And one way of looking at this, for example, adaptively stored information um, in relation to an uncomfortable event would be, I can survive I have survived. Now, let's say the house, my house burns down, I survived. The maladaptive approach would be like, there are still night terrors, we can't find rest around it, we have intensive flashbacks and intrusive thoughts and, and high anxiety. And um, this is a little bit about um, the 
AIP model. And maybe we move on to the next slide here. The idea is dysfunctionally stored memories and adaptively stored memories. Now, the idea here is then if we, so we, what we do address is the event. And of course, we don't change the event in the past. But what we change is the emerging negative cognition that emerged from an event. Now, let's say the house burns down, emerging self-cognition might be the world is not a safe place. And adaptively stored memories with, the, this is what we ask the client, is like creating a positive cognition. What would you rather say about yourself today, sitting here in my office? And it might be like, yeah, I'm safe enough. I'm not even living in the same town anymore. And the, I've like, fire alarm system installed here and yeah i am actually safe today we come into a more integrated experience so and i'm working with the internal family systems model adapted by janine fisher and i just want to um like point your yeah your eyes and your minds towards this as um, a bit of an extension of how emdr can be used again there is um there is some merit, I believe, in reframing the work we do with clients and as approaching our younger selves. The idea here is that if we experience certain attachment injuries, like neglect or abandonment, for example, in our vulnerable attachment years, especially between zero and 12 years old, that these younger selves are sometimes stuck in trauma time. That's, that's what we know about traumatic experiences. We experience a traumatic event, we go partly offline with our frontal lobe with it, the timestamp goes offline. And if we are not able to integrate that experience, we live partly in trauma time. And if the trigger comes up, like with the house, the smoke of the barbecue comes up and we smell the smoke, that then often leads to the triggering. It is actually happening yesterday. It happened 30 years ago, but we don't know that. We literally don't know that we really feel is happening now because it, the memory is stored without a timestamp. And just as a signal to when we work with, especially our vulnerable populations, it's like just noticing one thing, that while we are experiencing trauma and while we are experiencing trigger and while we experience really increased anxiety and an arousal, a state of arousal, we always have a going on with normal life part of self that is still there. We have survived, we are here now, we are here today, we are in the office, we are in the street, we are with each other today. So there's an integrated adult self. And one part of it is the going on with normal life part, it's still there. And then we have a trauma related part of the personality and that can be broken down in yeah, basically five, five domains and I have them laid out here. And again, it's the fight, flight, freeze and on the lower end of, um, hypoarousal, we often have submission and attachment. Now, this is the needy part and the shameful part. These five, five, um, these are five ways of memory response to trauma. Now, these are five ways of memory response to trauma in order to try to survive. And so this model of having an integrated adult self carrying both parts, the regular normal life part and the trauma-related part, gives clients a leeway so noticing that while I am triggered, not everything is also been good. I can still anchor myself with also the accomplishment I still have made. So the dialectical view, if you like, that supposedly opposing truths could be true at the same time. And I am losing contact. I am dissociating here. I am noticing I'm getting in a higher arousal state at the same time, being aware of that we are also grounded, that we are also in an accomplished state that we have a goal on this normal life part. I found it very helpful in working with clients. The eight phase protocol. And um, yeah, just let's move forward here. Desensitization against uh, the movement, the eye movement is really one way we, we know that we get that from the REM sleep research, the rapid eye movements. And there's a lot to be said about the uh, modes, the techniques we use within EMDR. And we can always discuss it in later. A little later, maybe, and um, there is a protocol for substance use. Yeah, Popkey developed that. It's called the Detour Protocol, just as a reference here for further research. And again, evidence-based and 
especially also with clients with substance use disorders, significant improvements here, prostomatic symptoms, reduction in anxiety, reduction overall psychopathology levels, changes in self-esteem, decrease of depressive symptoms. Now the, the idea really not holding this back. So this trauma treatment doesn't have to be a fancy place to be where we feel we can never go. It is accessible, it's there, it could start today. So the other part I would like to briefly refer to because it is quite intriguing, is Seeking Safety. That's uh, developed by um, Najavitz here, Elisa. And um, the idea here is, um, this is a model that has been developed um, sp specifically for vulnerable populations. And its key principles are, Safety as a pri priority of treatment, integrated treatment, focused on ideals, four contact areas, cognitive behavioral, and so forth, and attention to clinical process. And the idea here was for, initially developed for, for, um, ex for people who experience substance use and traumatic experiences as a go to not processing, but working and learning how to cope and learning how to ground, how to find grounding provided by professionals who don't require a master's degree without any training. It's standardized, it's, it's, um, it's manualized and highly effective. Now, anyone can conduct seeking safety. Now, there's no degree required. Present focus coping skills has been successfully implemented by professionals of all sorts, para paramedics, peers, peer supporters, the advocates, no? so really um, throughout the spectrum. No reported adverse events related to seeking safety and training is available, but not required. That's so the idea evidence based as model for co occurring PTSD and substance abuse, strongly supported by research or substance use issues here rather. Evidence use includes pilot studies, controlled trials, studies in address vulnerable various populations and formats, really very inclusive and highly complex populations and especially also with folks with PTSD experience. And um, again, this is like the model, like these are 25 treatment topics and you can shift them around. You can pick one out, you can do all 25, very flexible here. And if you are a stakeholder within an organization, I highly recommend looking into Seeking Safety as a, as a manual that's accessible, their websites and you and download the manual and, yeah, considering that as one arm or one treatment arm, when you work with populations that are experiencing or having a close relationship to the current overdose crisis. Now, any group size is possible, flexible approach, abstinence-based, harm reduction or controlled use. Now, it does not matter and it can be used with any other therapy or treatment concurrently, now, including EMDR. So, okay, so that's just um, see like a cost benefit. Now this is just always nice to have. It's really high research. Now, there's a lot of information even in the web. You can get that right there. 80-80% of likelihood of benefit relative to costs and so forth. Now again, the math is self-evident. So if you don't need any training, now you don't do require a master's degree and everybody can actually facilitate that. So pathways to integration is nothing else than the the reach here to discuss seeking safety, mindfulness-based stress reduction, EMD, and ACT as possible ways to bring psychotherapy more into the forefront when we try to tackle the overdose response. So thank you so much for your time and yeah, thank you and nice discussion. <laughs>